good morning. Welcome to Victory Baptist Church this morning. Let's all get a songbook, stand and turn to page 260. Page 260. Still a little thin, but uh, I'm glad when everybody gets back. And I want everybody to have traveling grace as they travel about here and on, off in different places. But it's good to see everyone here today. Um, today we're going to have uh, Brother Paul Mushin and his wife and family here with us today singing and uh, preaching for us today. And uh, they're right over here. So uh, if you will, just help them out and praise them and pray for them and uh, just welcome him here today. It's good to have him. I was telling uh, Mrs. Mush in there that uh, remember her as a little girl when her mom and dad came. Uh, Brother David, you know, was here a couple of weeks ago to preach the uh, uh, revival for us, and that's one of his daughters. And uh, she used to come and sing and do, and, and uh, I can't believe that uh, she's grown up. I told her I didn't get any older, but... <laughs> I've always been this old. So anyhow, it's good to have them today. Um, like I said, it's good to have everybody today, and uh, I'd like to uh, go over the prayer list here today. People that we need to pray for, a lot of things going on in their lives, and I'd like to pray for our troops, our missionaries, families of uh, Victory Baptist Church, Kenley Edwards, James and Beulah Edwards, Melvin and Patsy Franklin, Dwayne Combs, Spring Robertson, Edward Poole, Snookum Abbott, 
Junior Stevenson, Nate Bobbitt, Sandra Pendergrass, Tony and Brandy Bobbitt, Haven Short, Donald Talbert, Sue Sedliff, Kim McFalls, Evan and Janet Mitchell, Tony Hill, Janice Harp Watson, Everett Egan, Cody Grass, Tony Fisher, Darlene Hanford, Christina Franklin, Reggie Wynn, Alice Rains, George Grissom, Gary Williams. And also we'd like to pray for our um, homebound and shut-ins. We have uh, Marvin Roberson, John Matthews, Pat Matthews, and Sarah Gupton. Um, I'd like to, for us all to pray for these folks. And this time I'd like to uh, call on Brother Ricky Pendergrass to pray for us, please. Bow his. Lord, we do thank you again for the the opportunity we get to be here on this Sunday morning in your house, dear Lord, and we ask you to just bless and touch and meet the needs of each and every one, each and every request that was mentioned here this morning, dear Lord, and we do pray you just bless here today. Bless the, uh, our visiting preacher, uh, Brother, Brother Paul Munston and his family, dear Lord, and pray you just uh, give him what we need, dear Lord, as he preaches the word of God, and we ask you just keep your hands upon him. We ask you now to just bless here to bless the special singing, the singing of the choir. Uh, and whatever's done, dear Lord, we pray that it's done for your honor and your glory only. We pray it all in our Savior's name, Jesus Christ. Amen. <coughs>
Let's all stand up, turn around, and fellowship as the choir comes down. Like I say, it's good to see everyone here again today. Just a few announcements here. Like I say, we got Brother Paul Mushin and his family with us today. Our preacher has gone uh, down to Edenton, down that way, to preach a revival uh, today and tonight and a few days this week. So we asked Brother Paul and his wife and family to come and be with us, and they so graciously agreed to come. So we're glad to have them this morning. I ask everyone to please make them feel welcome and all. Glad to have them. At this time, uh, there's a few announcements here. Don't forget, uh, next week, the youth are going to put on a barbecue lunch right after church. And uh, they're asking for everyone, if they will, to make a $10 donation, if you can, for each plate. And uh, it's going to be good, I can tell you that. Everything they've done so far, especially when it's got to do with eating, it's good. It's good. As you know, us Baptists, we like to eat. So... Uh, Next week, right after church, we're going to have that barbecue lunch. You say, well, hey, I don't really care for barbecue. Well, if you will, just go by and leave my donation. And speak to them and say, hey, glad you put it on. Thanks a lot. And uh, then you can go and, and eat whatever you would like. But I guarantee you, it's going to be great. So, uh, and don't forget the service tonight at 6 o'clock. Uh, be back with us tonight. Brother Paul will be preaching again tonight. And his family will be singing. So be sure to... Uh, come on back tonight. At this time, I'd like to uh, take up an offering. Take up an offering. I'd like for the ushers to come, please. Brother Tim, will you pray for us? Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the stage you've given us, Father. We Thank you for your love, your grace, and your mercy, Lord. Thank you for the precious blood of Jesus, Lord, that cleanses us from all unrighteousness, Lord. And, Lord, we do lift up uh, the service here to you today, Father, and, uh, Lord, uh, the radio ministry, Lord, and those that might be watching on Facebook, Lord, and someone's here or watching or listening, Lord, that don't know you as their Savior, Lord. Just pray that the, today they would come to know you, Lord, before it's eternally too late, Lord. We ask, Lord, that you be with our pastor and his family, Lord, in Edenton um, today and throughout the week, Lord, as he preaches. And we ask that you uh, bless Brother Paul and his family, Lord, today. And bless him as he preaches, Lord. Just use him in a mighty way, Lord, to speak to our hearts today, to give us what we need, Father. And we ask now, Lord, that you bless this offering, Lord, that you use it to further thy kingdom, Father. And we ask it in the wonderful name of Jesus and for his sake. Amen.
<clears throat> like I said, our preacher and his family has gone down to the coast, so ask for you to pray for them while they're gone, uh, that the Lord be with them each and every day, and that they'll have safe passage back and forth and back to our house here, Father, keep them safe. Uh, just uh, also, I'd like to, uh, Sandra would like to see all the women of the church right after service today. We have a little meeting. Um, we have Pastor Appreciation Day coming up. And uh, so I think they would like to talk, the women of the church, talk about Pastor Appreciation Day just a little while. It won't be long, probably not more than two or three hours. Uh, you know how women are when they get together talking. So, no, it, it shouldn't be just a few minutes uh, trying to get some more ideas and different things going on. So if you will, just stay over after the service today uh, for a few minutes and talk with Sandra and, and some of the other ladies at the church about Pastor Appreciation Day. And I think that's all the announcements we have for this time. Um, so if you will, Brother Paul and your family, if you would come. Uh, Brother Paul and his wife, they're going to do some special singing for us today. And Brother Paul is going to preach for us. Amen. It's good to be here this morning. Hey, good to have you. Appreciate Brother Rick and calling us. Glad our schedule worked out that we could be here with you guys. Love you guys. Love you guys. Love your preacher. We go, we go back a long way. Meeting him when I was younger than my boy. So how old he is. He's old. <laughs> Not me. He's old. But I grateful, grew up with him, grew up with his, with his family, and I'm excited about being here. Y'all pray for us. We'll sing a couple this morning. We'll let the boys and the men sing a couple. So. Trying, to, trying to make the greatest to see everybody. Pray for you.
I'm glad throughout life I can say that song is a reality. And uh, no matter what you're going through this morning, uh, what you brought with you, I can assure you of this, he is more than enough. Yeah. Yeah. up here and go see some family we hadn't seen in a while and um, not only that get to be with you guys in fact my mom grew up about a mile from here uh, my dad grew up about well kind of the way the crow flies a couple miles from here so uh, it's it's nice to, to be back and I think I just broke the lapel mic so we'll get it back here in a second um, but I'm grateful that we're here this morning and uh, I'm glad we can Come to church. Glad we can come to church. Be turning in your Bible to the book of 2 Samuel, chapter 9. 2 Samuel, chapter 9, this morning. Grateful for the good Sunday school lesson, Hannah, or on um, Samuel, and how, how he was prayed over and sought after. And I'm grateful for those who have invested in my life. 2 Samuel chapter 9 this morning. I don't one of my one of my favorite, more favorite chapters in the Bible. But uh you don't hear a lot about it anymore. But it's a a chapter that we all can associate with. You know, there are some stories in the Bible you say, well, I've never been down that road before. So I can read about it and I can grasp it a little bit, but I can't associate with that. But when you deal with 2 Samuel chapter 9, 
I can assure you everyone in here can associate with because we're dealing with a man by the name of Mephibosheth. And Mephibosheth is a great picture of the sinner, and that's what we all were. That's what we all are. And I'm grateful for this story. And I've been looking throughout my Bible, and there are several places in our Bible where if you kind of take the story, you could say, boy, you can really find grace in that story. And I know I get it, I get it, the whole Bible, you can find that there, I understand that. But there are some stories in our Bible that seem just a little bigger, and maybe the mountaintop's a little taller than others. And you know, you find, think of Noah in the book of Genesis. He found grace in a flood. And then you think of, of Ruth, in Ruth in the book of Ruth, and how she found grace in a field. And then you go on to 1 Kings and you'll find where Elijah found grace by a fire. And then you'll continue on in the book of Daniel and you'll see where the three Hebrew boys found grace in a furnace. And then in Luke chapter 23, you'll see where the thief found grace in a fix. He was on the cross. He was, he was seconds from eternity and grace rescued him. But in Acts chapter 16, we find Paul and Silas as they found grace in their fetters. But here in 2 Samuel chapter 9, I want to preach just a, a few minutes this morning on Mephibosheth and how he found grace in the fetching. 2 Samuel chapter 9, I'm going to read the entire chapter. It's only 13 verses, but I want to read the entire chapter. The Bible says, and David said, Is there yet any that is left of the house of Saul, that I may show, ki show him kindness for Jonathan's sake. And there was, one, or there was of the house of Saul a servant whose name was Ziba. And when they had called unto him David, the king said unto him, Art thou Ziba? And he said, Thy servant is he. And the king said, Is there not yet any of the house of Saul, that I may show kindness of God unto him? And Ziba said unto the king, Jonathan hath yet a son, which is lame on his feet. And the king said unto him, Where is he? And Ziba said unto king, Behold, he is in the house of Machar, the son of Amiel, in Lodabar. Then king David sent and fetched him out of the house of Machar, and, and the son of Amiel from Lodabar. When Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, was come unto David, he fell on his face and did reverence. And David said, Mephibosheth, and he answered, Behold thy servant. And David said unto him, Fear not, for I will surely show thee kindness for Jonathan thy father's sake, and will restore thee all the land of Saul thy father, and thou shalt eat bread at my table continually. And he bowed himself and said, What is thy servant, that thou shouldest look upon such a dead dog as I am? Then the king called to Ziba, Saul's servant, and said unto him, I have given unto thy master's son all that pertain to Saul and to all his house. Thou therefore and thy sons and thy servants shall till the land for him, and thou shalt bring in the fruits that thy master's son may have food to eat. But Mephibosheth, thy master's son shall eat bread always at my table. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. Then said Ziba unto the king, According to all that my lord the king hath commanded his servants, so shall thy servant do. As for Mephibosheth, said the king, he shall eat at my table as one of the king's sons. And Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah. And all that dwelt in the house of Ziba were servants unto Mephibosheth. So Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem, for he did eat continually at the king's table and was lame on both of his feet. Lord, I pray for the next few minutes. Lord, you'd help us. Lord, may you uh, get any hindrances out of the way. But Lord, may you just speak through me this morning. May my words uh, be correct. And Lord, may I, I speak in a manner that these folks can get what's on my heart on their own heart. Lord, I pray that you would help us. In Christ's name, amen. And again, I say, we, we all have something in common with Mephibosheth. 
So if you're here this morning and thinking, that's a mighty big name, and I've never really heard that story, well, I want you to really listen to me this morning because you and I have something in common with him. We were all doomed until the king came by us. We were all living in Lodabar until the king came to where we were. And I'm grateful for the day that he saved me. I'm grateful for the day that he came to my Lodibar, and I mean no disrespect by this. My Lodibar was just down the road in Norlina. I was, I remember as a young boy in Norlina, how for the first time it seemed the king's chariot came through Gospel Baptist Church. Oh, I know he came through there before, but he sure never came for me before. And for the first time on that Sunday morning, I remember the king's chariot or rolling through Gospel Baptist Church. And I remember as a young boy sitting right over there, I knew at that point that I was living in Lodabar and I was lame on my feet. But I was grateful that he did not leave me there and that was the morning that he saved me. But in looking at Mephibosheth, there are some things that I want to look at, four simple things in this, in this chapter. The first thing I see in this chapter is the fall of Mephibosheth. His name is an interesting name. His name literally means a shameful thing. It, he is a picture of every single sinner. He is a picture of you and I because just like he, he was, you and I were in a desperate condition. There was an inquiry made in verse 1. I find this kind of ironic in chapter 9 verse 1. David here is asking, is there anyone left in the house of Saul. Now, just a couple years before this, Saul was the most influ influential man in the nation of Israel. He was the king. We know the life of King Saul. And if you would have mentioned just a couple years before this, Saul in general, everybody would have known. But yet the new king, King David, had to even ask, is there anyone left of the house of Saul. Can I just tell you, Mephibosheth's fall here is something that deserves a second look. Mephibosheth here, in looking at his fall, we see the cause of his fall. To understand that, you have to go back a couple chapters. In 2 Samuel chapter 4, verse 4, the Bible says there, and Jonathan, Saul's son, had a son that was lame on his feet. He was five years old when the tidings came of Saul and Jonathan out of Jezreel. And his nurse took him up and fled. And it came to pass as she made haste to flee that he fell and became lame. And his name was Mephibosheth. We learn that Mephibosheth's fall came because of someone else. His fall was not his own responsibility. His fall was because of someone else. Well, I want you to know, when you were born, you were born a sinner. I get it. Babies are cute. Most of them are cute. Some of them are just plain out ugly. But most of them are, well, we'll just go with some of them are cute. Most of them are ugly. They got their face mashed. Together. You got it. But, but, but when you're born, you love those babies. You just want to hold them. But you know you're holding a sinner. You know that little baby is, is doomed for hell if God don't intervene. I want you to know that is such a sad thing. That child had nothing to do with it. It was because of the fall of Adam and Eve many years ago that when we were born, we were doomed, just like Mephibosheth. We've been crippled by the fall. But now Mephibosheth is crippled, and because of him being crippled, he could not go to the king. He would not go to the king, and he did not. Go to the king. Mephibosheth's life was, sent, was spent in poverty, was spent just making things get by. And yet, his crippledness was what was keeping him from the king. Can I just tell you, a spiritual cripple can't walk. When you're crippled, you're not going to go to the king. There is nothing in our life that merits us approaching him. There's nothing you can do. You're not good enough. You're not smart enough. You're not rich enough. 
You're don't, you don't work hard enough. You don't do enough good deeds. You don't sing well enough. You don't preach well enough. You don't do this well enough. I want you to know you do nothing well enough to approach Him. We're all on the bottom. You say, when I got saved, I was on the bottom. Well, I want you to know as a young boy in North Carolina, North Carolina, when I got saved, I was on the bottom. If you got saved, you were on the bottom. If you're here this morning and you've never been saved, you're on the bottom. You're on the bottom. We were all on the bottom. Mephibosheth was on the bottom. But I'm glad that doesn't mean we have to stay there. The cause of his fall. Then I see the condition from his fall in verse 3 and 4. This was no routine fall here. My boys are a thousand percent boys. They ain't nothing new. Nothing surprising at my house when they come in asking for a Band-Aid. The only thing you got to look and see is it really, do you need to go to the doctor or is a Band-Aid going to fix this problem? I was leaving school a couple weeks, a couple days ago, and my youngest one was getting picked up by my dad. And I looked at the mirror and I seen him running, acting a fool like his mama. <laughs> and uh, come running up the side of the driveway, and I was like, "What is this? What is, whose kid is this? I wish some parent needs to handle his own kid. He's running through the middle of the parking lot, and it was my kid." And uh, so I stopped, and I'm like, what are you doing? He said, hey, I just wanted to tell you, I think I broke my finger today. I said, well, that's good. That's good. How it happened? He holds his finger up. It's nice and swollen. And uh, he says, well, I was playing on the playground, and me and Christian had a, we run into each other, and we fail. I thought, Lord, help us. And uh, he may have broken his finger. I don't know. I ain't taking him to the doctor for that. I'll tape it up and do what the doctor did, right? But what I'm saying is my boys fall all the time. But this is not the fall that we're talking about. This fall was a life-changing fall. I don't understand. I don't know what happened from what I read. I read after even more authors last night. It appears that she had, during the fall, dropped him. But whatever the fall was, it changed his entire life. It left him helpless. The Bible says he was lame on his feet. But it also left him hopeless because he says he was in Lodabar. Lodabar is a place of no pasture. It's a dry and desolate place. If you stop the story right here, if we just close the Bible and stop at verse 4, Mephibosheth is in a bad spot. Mephibosheth is on a road that has no good outcome to it. But you know... If we were to have stopped our lives in verse 4, we would have been in the same place. We would have been on a, in a dead-end road, headed to hell, where we rightfully deserve to be. Let's just be honest. But I'm glad our story don't stop in verse 4. I'm glad our Lord didn't leave, or our king in this story didn't leave Mephibosheth in Lodibar. I'm glad we see the fall of Mephibosheth. But it, moving on in this chapter, we see the fetching of Mephibosheth. Do we know, do you, you ever thought about what Mephibosheth needed? You ever thought about that? He didn't need money. I would have made life a little bit better for a few minutes, but he didn't need money. He certainly didn't need justice. Because if he would have gotten justice, he would have already been dead. Because we'll see that in a second, but the king's custom is to kill all of the prior king's family. So if he would have gotten justice, he, he definitely would have already been dead. He didn't need mercy, for mercy would have just simply left him alone in his miserable condition. What he needed was grace. What he needed was God's unmerited favor, stooping down to where he was and picking him up. Can I tell you, in your sin-sick soul, in your sin place, you don't need anything from the court system. You don't need anything from the social service system. What you need is God in His unmerited grace to come to where you are, to reach down to where you are and pick you up because He will pick you up. He will save you. In this picture of Mephibosheth, 
the fact that he needs grace, I see seeking grace in verse 5. David didn't wait on Mephibosheth. David didn't send word to Mephibosheth and tell him to come to him. David didn't wait on Mephibosheth to make the trip on his own. David sent the chariot to where he was. Can I just tell you, I don't want to scare you when I say this. When you got saved, you really wasn't looking for the Lord. You, when, when I came to church that morning, I was a normal little boy. I wanted to play. I wanted to do the, I wanted service to end because I knew I could go play tag outside. I was ready, for, but I wasn't looking for anything spectacular that day. But I'm glad on that day someone came a-looking for me. I love that song Gerald Crabb wrote. He came looking for me. Hey, I don't know what I was a-looking for, but I know what he was a-looking for that Sunday morning. He came looking for me. There was seeking grace. But also I see there was saving grace. Seeking implies looking to find. Saving indicates a relocation. If, 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 if we were looking for someone, if there was a missing child and we were on a search party and we were looking for them and we were searching diligently and it's getting to the point where it's becoming dire, that we have got to locate this child and then I walk around the corner and there's a child huddled behind a tree. I have sought that child. Let's just be honest. I have found that child but I still at this point have done nothing to save that child to save that child who is missing it takes me to approach that child to reach down in the condition that child is in whether it be weeds briars mud dirt I don't know and it takes me to lift that child that's the saving that I'm talking about David not only went to where Mephibosheth sent the servant to where Mephibosheth was to seek him out, but he saved him by picking him up and carrying him back to the palace. <clears throat> I don't understand. I, I, I like to visualize things when I read these stories. And I can just imagine the king's chariot rolling in front of Mephibosheth's house. Mephibosheth was crippled. He wasn't going to run, he couldn't run. I guarantee you, when he heard, and he maybe peeked out the window, he thought that was it. The king has found me, and he's coming to kill me. And here comes Ziba, a walking in. And I, I'm, again, I'm reading in the white part of the Bible right here. It just don't say this, but I think it. Ziba, we know, was Saul's servants. And it, for some reason, it to me, I find it ironic, I use that word loosely, that, uh, <clears throat> that Ziba was the one who went and found Mephibosheth because I bet sometime before Ziba and Mephibosheth had crossed paths while he was the servant of Saul. But Ziba walked in. Mephibosheth, Ziba, is that you? Man, I ain't seen you in forever. Yeah, yeah, I've been living down here in Lodabar. Well, I'll tell you what, you need to come on with me. No, nah, I can't come with you, Ziba. I can't even move. If it, if it wasn't for my, my housemates, I wouldn't get to get out of the chair. Ziba says, it's okay. I'm going to pick you up. I'm going to carry you to this nice new chariot out here. I'm going to carry you and place you into this chariot, and I'm taking you to the king's house. I don't know if it happened like that, but I sure like to think it did. And here... That's exactly what God does for us as a sinner. He comes to where we are, and he picks us up, and he gives us a, a relocation. It's one thing. It's one thing to invite somebody to your house, but it's another thing to go pick them up in a limousine and bring them to your house. And that's what David did. We see the seeking grace. We see the saving grace, but we also see in this text there's the sovereign grace. He wasn't doing this for Mephibosheth. Now, I, David was showing compassion to Mephibosheth, but he wasn't doing it for Mephibosheth. He was doing it for his Jonathan's sake. See, this, this agreement here, or this outcome, was from an agreement years 
pass. Second Samuel chapter 2, I believe. David and Jonathan enter into an agreement, saying, I'll be your best friend. And whatever happens, I'll take care of you. Jonathan says, David, whatever happens, I'll take care of you. Well, we know the story. Jonathan and Saul were killed. David lost his best friend. But years after that, the, uh, the agreement that he entered into with Jonathan has now come full circle, and David is not rescuing Mephibosheth because it's Mephibosheth. He is rescuing Mephibosheth because of his father, Jonathan. I want you to know this morning that when God saved you, oh, he loves you, he died for you, but he did it for his son's sake. He saved you for his son's sake. You see, he died on the cross for you, and when the Lord says, I'm going to save you because of what my son did, hey, you're just the, the recipient of something very big that you had nothing to do with. The sovereign grace. When it comes to salvation, God thought it, Jesus bought it, the Spirit wrought it, and the devil fought it, but I got it. Hey, I don't understand all that. I can't grasp all that, but I'm glad it's true. I'm glad it's a reality. He came to where I was. He picked me up and he saved me. The fall of Mephibosheth. The fetching of Mephibosheth. But the third thing here I see is the fear of Mephibosheth. Now he takes the chariot ride to the king. And we get to verse 6 of chapter 9. And it says, Now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, was coming to David, he fell on his face. <clears throat> Do you remember when you met the king? Do you remember that day you realized for the first time you were just a nobody? You was a worthless scum. And yet, he still saved you. He still loved you. And here, this is what happened to Mephibosheth. He gets in front of the king, and there's a fear that overcomes him. How do you know? We'll show you in a second. But we see that there was a concern that occupied him. The Bible says David said, fear not. I don't know. I guess he was sitting there shaking in his boots. And David had to say, whoa, fear not. It's okay. I ask you to come. This is all me. The Zeba didn't even have nothing. I said, Zeba, go get him. I have something in store for you. But then there's the, not only the concern that occupied him in this fear, but that fear quickly led to the consideration that overwhelmed him. He said that thou shouldest look upon such, as, such a dead dog as I am. I, I remember the story I read. It reminded me of this. There was a, a Native American man. I'm going to be politically correct. Aren't y'all proud of me? Uh, there was a Native American man, and he was gloriously saved. And somebody, one of his friends, come up and said, Sir, would you please tell me what being saved is all about? We don't understand that terminology. We don't understand what happened to you. That man looked around, and he found a worm, an earthworm. And, he put the, and then he laid the earthworm on the ground, and he put dry leaves and dry shrubs all the way around that earthworm. He reached down and lit the fire, and those dry leaves and all of that in, in, circled around that earthworm. And he sat there as the fire burned and seemingly was getting closer to the earthworm. Surely the earthworm was now getting ready to die. And at the last second, that man reached down and he picked that worm up. And he said, he looked at him just as clearly as he said. And he said, me, worm, hand, God. Hey, he just got it. He just, he just explained salvation the only way we can. I'm the worm. I was destined to die. But hey, out of nowhere, the hand of God came and picked me up. The consideration that overwhelmed him. <laughs> Mephibosheth didn't understand what was going on. The fear of Mephibosheth. But the last thing in this text I want to look at and I'll be done. Not only the fall of Mephibosheth, the fetching of Mephibosheth, and the fear of Mephibosheth, 
But lastly, I see the favor to Mephibosheth. I'm reminded of a man who had an orphanage. And this was no normal orphanage, you see. This man specialized in finding kids that no one else wanted. Maybe it was the lame. Maybe it was someone who was maimed, who was handicapped. And this man and his family specialized in finding those children. Well, he got rumor her or her, her news that there was a young girl who had just lost both of her parents in a fire. And throughout the fire, she was also uh, very badly injured. And he, the, the story went on that he went to the hospital as she was being uh, discharged from the hospital. And she'd come walking out. And he said, young lady, would you like to come live at my house? And she looked kind of funny. And she said, sir, you don't want me. He says, ma'am, I'd love for you to come live at my house. And she says, sir, you don't want me. I'm ugly. I'm scarred. I'm, I'm nasty. Nobody's going to ever want me. I just, I, I don't know what I'm going to do. That man reached down and picked that little girl up and began to kiss her scars. And he says, oh, you're the kind of girl I want to come live with me. Hey, I want you to know in your life you were scarred, you were dirty, you were on the road to hell, but he's the one who picked you up and he showed favor to you. We see he was accepted by the king in verse 9. You got to remember he was crippled. Everywhere he went was a task to get there. Either he had to drag his feet, maybe he had some crutches, or someone had to carry him. And here, David, in the spite of his nastiness, I'm sure, let's just be honest, I'm sure he probably didn't clean his wounds the way he should have cleaned them. And I'm sure his dressing maybe was dirty, maybe had an odor to it. And David didn't say, hey, bring the nurse in and clean him up. I'm sure that happened. That wasn't David's concern. He said, I'll tell you what, Mephibosheth, you just plan on eating at my table for the rest of your life. He was given a portion. Everything that Saul had was given back to Mephibosheth. He was also given provisions in verse 10. He, with, with just one trip... With just one move from Lodabar, he is now living in the palace. He was given a permanent place at the king's table. The king accepted him. But in verse 11 through 13, this carries the idea that the king adopted him. To be adopted means that you not only have access to the king's possessions, but you become rightful owner of the king's possessions. When you adopt a child... They not only have access to your possessions, they become rightful owners of your possessions. I'm glad when I got saved, I didn't, I, I was adopted. I now can say I am a child of a king. I'm an heir to what he has. Everything that he has is mine. I don't, I don't deserve it, but he, when he sees me, he's not looking at me. He's looking at the work his son did on the cross. Hey, I'm glad that that I'm adopted. He was given a place and he was given a part. Let's think about this. He went from a pauper to a prince. <clears throat> Not only did Mephibosheth had fellowship with the king but, and enjoyed the fortune of the king, but now he was officially part of the family of the king. Remember how David emphasized three times in our text that he would be sitting at the table. My mind began to wander again. And I began to think about a dinner setting. My family's a nut. Y'all know that. Y'all know my dad. And when you get my brother and myself and my sister together, life at the table can be quite interesting. And so I began to think about David's table setting as this goes on. And I imagine the dinner bell will ring. And David come into the room and sat down. And a few more, few more minutes, Amnon, Mr. Clever, Mr. Crafty, come in and sit next to David. 
Then a few minutes later, maybe Tamar come in. She's beautiful, long, flowing, look, just beautiful complexion. Sits next to David. And then across the way, out of the study, comes Solomon, who had been reading and just absorbing everything that he was reading. And then maybe, maybe Absalom came in that day and sat down with the king. I don't know on this particular, even maybe, maybe even Joab, the courageous uh, commander-in-chief of David's army, come in, set all of his military and his, his equipment out of the corner and went and sat at the table. Well, that's a table a, full of prestige. And then all of a sudden, I just imagine hearing in the background a clank and a drag, a clank that walker and a drag, a clank and a drag, and old Mephibosheth gets to the table, and it's all he can do to pull himself up on that table, and he gets up on that table, and that tablecloth covers up his inches, and old Mephibosheth sits at that table with all those people, and I don't know, maybe Mephibosheth just looked around, and he said, guys, can I say something? David said, well, of course, Mephibosheth, you're like my kids. So, say something. Maybe he, he, he looked up and said, Once I was clothed in the rags of my sin, wretched and poor, lost and lonely within, but with wondrous compassion, the king of all kings, in pity and love, he took me under his wings. Oh, yes, oh, yes, I'm a child of the king. His royal blood now flows in my veins. And I, who was wretched and poor, now can sing. Praise God, praise God. I'm a child of a king. After I was saved, I might have started singing this verse. Well, now I'm a child who with a heavenly home you see my holy father well he made me his own and i'm cleansed by his blood oh i'm clothed in his love and someday i'll see who oh, with the angels above oh yes oh yes I'm a child of the king. His royal blood now flows in my veins. And I, who was wretched and poor, now can say, Praise God, praise God. I'm a child of the King. I say this morning as I close, we were all like Mephibosheth. Every one of us. If you're saved, you're like Mephibosheth. But if you're here this morning and you're looking at me and you say, I don't understand what you're telling me, preacher. Well, you too are like Mephibosheth. You may still be living in Lodabar. You may still be living in Lodabar this morning. But I want you to understand that the king's chariot will come and lift you from Lodabar and take you to the palace where you too can be adopted. Heads bowed, eyes closed. If someone would come to the piano, you could stand to your feet if you'd like. Lord, I pray that you would help us this morning. Lord, as we close this service, Lord, may we close it the way you would have it. Help us, God. As she begins to play, maybe this morning you just want to come and say thank you, Lord, for saving me. 
Hey, I remember when I was in Lodabar. I remember when I was living in that condition. And I'm grateful that he saved me. But maybe you're here this morning and you say, I need to be saved. I need some help. You'll never know the favor that you're going to get from being saved. I never knew what all salvation was going to give me. I understood that once I was saved, I was going to heaven. And that was great. But do you know many years down the road, now that I'm getting older, I'm still getting benefits, new benefits from salvation. There are things in my life that I would never have gotten if it wasn't for salvation. I'm here again to tell you, he'll save you. You say, you don't know me, sir. I don't know you. But I want to tell you this. I know one who could save you. I know one who is wanting to save you this morning. The Bible says he came to seek and to save that which is lost. His mission was to save you. I don't want you to leave this morning lost. Today is the day of salvation. She's going to play one more verse and we're going to close. But I'm here to tell you, he can save you this morning. Young man, he can save you. Young lady, he can save you. Uh, Older lady, older man, middle age, he can save you. He can save you this morning. Lord, I thank you for the liberty that we've had. Lord, I thank you for this church. And Lord, I pray that there's one here this morning that's never been saved. God, I pray that you would continue to speak to them. Lord, make their day uncomfortable, make their night even more uncomfortable. Lord, I pray that they would be saved before it's too late. Thank you for all you did for us. In Christ's name, amen. Thank you for your attentiveness.